Hello and uh, welcome to uh, Trana up north in uh, Norway. It's uh, truly an honor to have uh, you here, uh, Johannes, Johannes Krause from uh, Max Planck Institute in, uh, in Leipzig. And, and, uh, and we are here together um, because there is an ongoing excavation on this island right next here. From, um, uh, done by Niku in, uh, here in Norway. Um, we've been out there today and looking at it. It's uh, very, it was very interesting, wasn't it? No, it's an impressive site and I mean it's one of the few mass burials yeah. that was found at the site um, from actually northern Scandinavia that comes probably from the time of the Black Death, yeah. so from the 14th century, where we have three um, mass graves in, yeah. in, in, in the island that were already actually discovered in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, and it's really fascinating to see them actually uh, where they were and uh, one of them is in a cave and we visited the cave today and it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful <laughs> and amazing sight actually to see. It is, it is. It's a very special place here also where uh, people who travel even 10,000 years ago out here uh, to hunt uh, for seal. And uh, imagine just, I mean, if you're pretty far from the mainland, you just use boats out here. It's just, it's 50 kilometers, right? Um, yeah, it's a truly a special place. So there are three mass burial sites here. And, and uh, um, our friend Arlen here from the IQ, he said uh, probably more than 50 people were buried here. And uh, there's a story here. It's very, very exciting. But that's not what we're here talking about now, because Arlen and I we, uh, had... Um, a very interesting conversation with Johannes yesterday, and, and we, we heard about um, different um, what you talked about with uh, haplogroups groups and this focus on why why DNA. Uh, that I know many of you who are here on, on, on this channel here, um, whenever we've been talking with uh, family tree DNA, and, and uh, which um, when you take a DNA test, it tends to be a lot of focus on the Y DNA. People ask, oh, which haplogroup is that? And, uh, and that's something that I've seen a lot in the past few years. And the conversation we had yesterday was in regards to how many genes do we really talk about here? And how much does the Y chromosome and this focus on, on the haplogroup of the Y chromosome uh, matter? And, and um, what do you think about that? Or, yeah, I mean, what we have to keep in mind when we talk about genetic ancestry, so, you know, where does our DNA come from, is that the Y chromosome itself is only one what we call genetic locus. So it's just yeah. one region of the genome. Yeah. Yeah. And it has a story, right? There is a story to be told about the Y chromosome and where does the Y chromosome of our fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers' fathers come from, yeah. right? Like Which a, is an interesting story that some people are really interested in and would like to understand more about. But what those people have to keep in mind is that there is 3.2 billion positions in the nuclear genome, which is not the Y chromosome, um, and that are all having their own story. There are yeah. millions of genetic loci, which each come from different people. And if you just look over the last, say, a thousand years, on the Y chromosome, you have 30 ancestors, mm. right? Your father, father's father, father's father's father, father's father. In a father. straight line, right? In a straight line yeah. going back a thousand years. Yeah. 30 generations, let's say, of 30 years. Um, but if you look at the nuclear genome, you have two parents, four grandparents, yeah. eight grand-grandparents, 16 grand-grand-grandparents. Yeah. 32, 64, 128, and... So how many ancestors do you think you have over a thousand years well, on I, the nuclear genome? I'd say a billion, but... Uh, exactly right. You yeah. have about a billion. You yeah. have two to the power of 30. So a billion people. There's a billion stories to be told, uh, like the story of the Y chromosome. Yeah. So in a way, putting so much emphasis on the Y chromosome is a bit distracting from the fact that there's a billion other stories to be told on your ancestry yeah. that you're not focusing on. So just people should be aware and should keep that in mind, that it's just one out of millions of laws uh, and billions of stories to be yeah. told about your past and where your DNA is coming from. Of course, it's the male lineage, mitochondrial DNA is telling you the story of the female lineage, but the, it's good for that one gene, and it's maybe good to kind of place that somewhere. But for example, I have an African Y chromosome, yeah. right? 
I have uh, E2. It's kind of oh, you're, you're E2. Yes, I oh, am. Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's 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 one that you also find in southern Europe. Probably there has yeah. been some connection, you know, in the Holocene between northern Africa and the Balkan, and maybe I have some ancestors in the Balkan. But if I look at my nuclear genome, you know, when I do that with 23andMe, for example, yeah. they tell me that 99.9% .9 of my DNA is Central European, uh. and they can even now link it to a specific region in Germany where three out of four grandparents are coming from, right? I don't have, really have an African story. No, but no. if you only look at my Y chromosome, you might actually think, I'm African, even though I'm yeah, not that's, African. That's at all. really <laughs> curious. Why does, don't you have any hunter gatherer or any any farmer or yeah? I exactly. See. So it's, it's, it's pointed uh, like my ancestry is Central uh, European, and I have you know like uh, all Central Europeans, I have about twenty percent of my DNA coming from hunter gatherers, about twenty five thirty percent coming from you know steppe people that migrated here five thousand years ago, and yeah. about five. 50% of my DNA coming from Anatolian farmers that came here and spread farming in the early Neolithic yeah. to Central Europe, where the majority of my DNA is coming from. So out of the uh -huh. millions of stories about my ancestry that the genome can tell me from, half of them are from Anatolia. Yeah, right. My Y chromosome is African. Yeah. Kind of doesn't really fit the rest of the genome, right? <laughs> and then I have this 30% that might link it back to some people that lived 5,000 years ago in the Russian steppes. And some 20% is kind of, if you want, indigenous European, like hunter-gatherers that lived here for 40,000 so, years. So to make this really simple, uh, we are all, all very much related. That's certainly uh, true. And in regards to this straight paternal line, for example, or straight maternal line, um, some of this focus it should have something to do with uh, um, this similar focus on the patriarchal society and men traveled and migrated from uh, the steppe people, for example. Maybe that's some of the focus there, that they, the focus on just that, uh, the sex part of the... Uh, I mean, like, that can be interesting as well, right? That's like, you know, when we use in our research where we look at genetic history, how did the people end up where they are today at migrations that happened in the past? We also use the Y chromosome mm. because it does tell us a bit about, you know, for example, do we see more genetic turnover on the Y chromosome than we see on the mitochondrial DNA? Right. That tells us that the migration might have been more driven by males than females, yeah. so that the males were moving and the females were maybe local that were taken up by those people. Yeah. So if you look yeah. at the step migration, one of the largest micro migration events that have been revealed by genetic data some five, six, seven years ago, it was actually interesting to see that you have on the genomic level, on the nuclear genome, compared to the population that was living in Europe before the steppe people came, yeah. you have about 70-80% in Central Europe of genetic turnover, turnover where you basically yeah. see new DNA coming in. Mm. On the Y chromosome... That, that, that's a large percentage. It's a large percentage. It's like <laughs> to produce the same signal today in Central Europe, yeah. like the steppe migration. Mm. You would need to Europe one to five billion people migrants that would come in right for the same turnover for that the same experience over to, uh, to to happen but four thousand nine hundred years ago of course there were not a billion people living in europe right oh, no, like, like today yeah. but um, it was still thousands ten thousands of people that must have been on the move because it's mm. a short period we're talking about 150 years of this migration event when this over. turnover occurred yes right <laughs> and that's if that's a short it's, it's relatively short, <laughs> starting maybe about 4,900 years ago. People moved then from Eastern Europe into Central Europe, and then they expanded Great Britain about 4,600 years ago mm -hmm. to, to Iberia about 4,300 years ago, and, of course, also pretty early on, 4,800, 4,700 years ago to Scandinavia. Yeah, yeah. So um, then it's understandable with this focus on the, on the Y chromosome. Uh, on, on the migration pattern, as you say, that you can see a difference then in the DNA. Uh, but then, you, of course, you look at the whole. Yeah, you mm. look at the group, right? Mm. You want to understand the group dynamics that happen at the time. Yeah. I just warn people to take too much emphasis about their own ancestry, like where do my ancestors come from? I have this Y chromosome that is R1A, yeah. so I must be whatever, related to the step migration because that is a Y chromosome that has been spread at that time. Yeah. Yes, that's a Y chromosome that has been spread at that time. But it could still be that 99% of your ancestry is in other parts of the world and that yeah. I have an African Y chromosome doesn't really tell too much about my ancestry. It actually that's gives true. just a tiny little part of it. And the main story is actually um, in, in, in other parts of, of Europe. So 
I just warn people to be careful. What is interesting about it, though, is also if you want to understand societies in the past, yeah. because the Y chromosome is a large chromosome, it's millions of positions, about 10, 10 million positions in the genome, um, compared to mitochondrial DNA, which is quite short, it's only 16,000 positions. Yeah. So there is actually a lot of um, positions that can change, which causes us to give a fine grain uh, view on the relatedness of people. So we can actually use the Y chromosome oh. to say, this was, for example, a society that goes back to a male individual that had a lot of children, and then you have new lineages getting born, and you can really look at the individual mutations that happen throughout that large chromosome, and you can really zoom in a bit more into expansions that maybe have been driven by patrilineages, by some and, group, yeah. by some male individual or something like that. That can be uh, quite interesting if you look and at that at the past. That was a point. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we, t we, we touched a little bit about this um, yesterday because I've seen these this newspapers focusing on uh, all of people in Western Europe or all of, of people in Britain descend from one Bronze Age king, right? Uh, to try to put it uh, bluntly, so to say. But it, it's not necessarily that one person in England, present day England at the time, was the father of all of this. That could have happened earlier, as you say. Exactly. That could have happened earlier. There is an expansion, right? We are talking about an event where you have some sort of wave of expanding individuals. So imagine, you know, they had this society that expanded at the time that was somehow yeah, dominating the local population because otherwise how could it have replaced them? Yeah, yeah. So they had something. Either they had technology that was warfare, diseases, subsistence. So there was something that those people had so that they had more children than others. Mm. And then, of course, if there's a male in the front line of that expansion wave that had like four or five sons, and then those four or five sons also had four or five sons, mm. then you're basically, you know, with a factor of five, um, <laughs> of course. kind of doubling that population. And then they moved into other parts of, say, Central Europe first and Eastern Europe. Uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, uh, Great Britain eventually, so yeah. that a large percent of that population that actually arrives has the same or goes back to an ancestor uh, just a few generations back. And that's actually what we see. So we have data now from Bohemia where we really see groups arriving of individuals with the same Y chromosome that yeah. kind of go back to some person, probably somewhere in Eastern Europe, we don't know quite where mm. and where they came from, that have the same Y chromosome. Yeah. So there are patrilineages of those groups and that is in itself interesting because it kind of supports the idea that it was a largely male-driven migration because that's not just what we see on the Y chromosome compared to the mitochondrial DNA, but we also see it when you look at the X chromosome yeah. versus the rest of the genome. Right. Because males only have one X chromosome, females have two X chromosomes. If you see a different percent of the type of ancestry um, on the X compared to the rest of the genome, it tells you that it could be male or female driven. Right. And in the case of the step migration, what we see is we have more step DNA on the genome than we have on the X chromosome. So it's male-driven. It's male-driven mm -hmm. because basically the, the females were more local. They were more what we call early farmers, the Neolithic people, compared to the, the steppe people, which were males, and therefore there was less contribution on the X chromosome yeah. because they only had one and not two. And can we say something, just one last thing about the lactose tolerance? Because for some reason people have this perception that the steppe people had horses, everyone had horses, and they, they drank milk from cows. Mm -hmm when in fact they drank milk from, from goats or, uh, or sheep, right? Yeah, I mean, what we can see is that the, the, the evidence for horse riding yeah. of those steppe people, which, you know, in Eastern Europe, it was the Yamnaya culture that was associated to, the, to this expansion. Uh, in Central Europe, we call them corded wear. Hmm. In Northern Europe, we call them battle axe culture. Hmm. So this culture, we have almost no bones of horses in the yeah. burials. We don't see the horses. We don't have that. That's very interesting because that beats the sort of conception that a lot of people have, picturing these horse uh, riders step, from rider. the steppe. Yeah, yeah. It, it's basically circumstantial evidence. People say just a few hundred years before that, there were, was a culture, the Bowtie culture in Central Asia, in, in northern Kazakhstan, that had what people think, at least, domesticated horses. Yeah. One should say that all domesticated horses today, all, that are found in the world today. They go back to some horse ancestors that are actually in a different culture a thousand years after the Yamaya, which is the Sintashta culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they actually don't go back to those bow tie horses or those potential Yamaya horses that we don't have, by the way. So 
therefore we think that because there was an early domestication attempt by the Botai people, that those Yamuna people should have also had horses, but right, we don't have right. evidence for that. And, and that, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, we should find a horse. Uh, I mean, we, we know later times people were buried with a horse or yeah. several horses. Later times we do have that, yeah. um, but what we do have also is evidence for wagons, right? So yeah, mobility yeah. is important because what we're talking about is an expansion with quite, I mean, 150 years is still a lot of time, but it's really something where people took some time to move in a rather fast way in this yeah. nomadic lifestyle. Yeah. And they have wagons, they have wheels, wagons, that they have oxes, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Those wagons could have never been pulled by horses because yeah. they're way too heavy. Right. So those wagons are ox wagons. Yeah. So oxen were actually driving those or pulling those wagons and you don't need horses for them either. So and ox wagons, you know, you have your all your goods, you have your house, yeah, yeah, your yeah, nomad yeah. house, you put it on that big wagon, you right, drive it right. 50 kilometers uh, down the road uh, over a few days, and then you put up your tent and your, 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 your little house is there. And that's well possible. And the other thing is we find, you know, if we look at those uh, populations there, we don't have much evidence for cow milk yeah. consumption. We actually see that they were, they were mostly consuming um, sheep milk and goat milk and not cow milk. So and the whole image is actually different. What and that's the thing. About. And I'll, I'll finish off there because we can talk for hours now and we're not going to invite you to do that. That's going to be a long uh, video. But uh, in the end here, uh, when it comes to the driving uh, gene for selection, you told me to, for breakfast today that we see by far um, in the last 3,000 years, but especially in the first millennium uh, of our time, uh, do you know what that is? Or, or can I ask you what that is, if you can think about it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's lactose tolerance. It's yeah. actually really interesting. So there is a gene that people have, especially in Europe, that allows them to drink a lot of milk even when they're adults. Yeah. Usually mammals, all mammals, cats, dogs, <laughs> they all lose the ability to drink milk when they become adults because evolution does not want the mother to give milk Right. to adults right. Right. and say if there is a famine you know everybody would go to the mothers that are just breastfeeding and would yeah. kind of take their milk away yeah. from the babies yeah. evolution doesn't want that but what happened a few hundred or thousand years ago is that a, a gene was spreading in, in Europe that allows adults to drink milk we mm. call that now lactose tolerance mm. some people think about lactose intolerance as being a, a, some sort of disease no, but or, that's a normality but that's a normality yeah, that's right, the wild right. type that's what all humans <laughs> had yeah. 5,000 years ago yeah, yeah. and then 5,000 years ago we see the first evidence of this new gene actually appearing in Central Europe um, and this gene is actually on a low frequency for a very long time so we don't really see a high selection hmm. on this ability to drink a lot of milk Until only about a thousand years ago that starts a thousand years ago from today uh, no, sorry yeah. 3,000. 2,000 years ago, yeah. it actually starts. That first millennium uh, of our First time. millennium of For our some time. reason. For some reason. We don't yeah. know what it is, hmm. but it's really going up. That by the high medieval time, 1,000 years ago, yeah. it's in the frequency like it is today. And if you look at the Iron Age in Central Europe, it's actually at a low frequency of 1% or 2%. Today, it's in about 50% of all people in Central Europe. It's about 90% frequency in Northern Europe. Yeah. So basically, almost everybody has that gene. Think and we don't that. know... What is the driving factor? What is driving the selection? What is good about drinking, being able as an adult to drink a lot of milk? And I think the best explanation I could think of is that what happened during that time is that the cows actually changed. We had actually mm. cows 5,000 years ago that could produce two liters of milk a day, right? Yeah. Today, our Holstein cow, the black and white cow, produces 40 to 50 liters of milk a day. Right, right. So only when you have, you know, those families had maybe three, four, five cows that were giving milk. Only when you have so much milk, right? Lots of, like you have then a cow that gives yeah. 10 liters, 15 liters, you have enough milk that you can really take it as a nutritious source, even as an adult. You get energy from it. You can, huh. you, you can just drink it like that. And why would it be different in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe? Because if you think about it, if you've ever been in, I know you've been in Central Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they give you kumis, mm. and horse milk, yeah, fermented horse milk. <laughs> I ask those people, how do you make it? And yeah. they, what do you mean? It's like, how do you produce kumis? And I like, what do you mean? You, you, milk, you milk the horse. It's like, but, but, but it's alcoholic. What do you do? You just wait for four hours, then it becomes alcoholic. Yeah. It's actually fermenting by itself because yeah. it's warm and there are bacteria on the hands, so basically it yeah. starts fermenting. Right, right. However, if you milk a cow here, say in Norway, like where we are today, yeah. you put that milk just, you know, outside, it will take 10 days, yeah. two weeks before it really starts fermenting because it's so cold. However, in Southern Europe, it also takes four hours and then starts fermenting because it's 30 degrees outside. Right, right. So, so basically, uh, 
there's a natural fermentation. Fermentation means the sugar is broken down. Mm. You can drink, even if you're lactose intolerant, fermented products. Mm. No problem. Kefir, Iran, yeah, yeah. yogurt, all products from Southern Europe, right? Yeah. Because they naturally occur there. But in Northern Europe, the milk stays fresh. Yeah. So if you have a lot of milk, the only way to cope with the milk lactose is to be able to digest it. And that is the gene that we have. Southern Europeans didn't need it in the past because the bacteria do the job for them so, so they could then still drink the milk. So that's, uh, I'm going to leave you there now, uh, also because we're almost out of battery here, I see. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoyed this 20-minute chat together. We were only going to talk for six, seven minutes. But, uh, <laughs> We have a lot to, <laughs> to talk about if you want to. So, um, hope you appreciated uh, this, and uh, thanks, Johannes. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk again soon. Take care. Bye bye.